You're listening to Depth Perception, supported by our patrons on Patreon. Today we're doing um, The Time Machine by H.G. Wells, written in, I think, 1895. Uh, This book is an early entry in the, it's, I think, the first entry in, like, the sort of the modern science fiction uh, time travel subgenre. It's certainly, like, the preeminent sci-fi novel. And it's also one of, yeah, it's one of the, it set the tone for sci-fi as a genre in many ways, too. It's, it's like, up there with, uh, like, just the War of the Worlds in terms of uh, influence, also, of course, by H.G. Wells. Right, right, also. Exactly. So, what I want to do here is talk about the plot and avoid just going into way too much detail. So, real quick, you should go read it. Uh, what's anything graphic in this that I want to warn people about? There's some killing of maybe human creatures i'll touch back on this later but um the the storyteller really really seems to delight in the battering of of morlocks of the morlocks he definitely also there's things that he says that reveal him to be a racist probably like a phrenologist or some shit you know um so you have a so i'm talking about the time machine his perspective right the hg wells is basically well Let's think. I kind of think of H.G. Wells as the point of view character, even though he has a different name in the book. I think his name's Hillier. So he's this young guy who's going to these meetings of these people with just interesting curiosities, interest for of like the weird and like sort of edge science, I guess pseudoscience, basically things that are maybe not quite yet science. It's just like educated people but of slightly kinda, varying social I, classes. I kind of imagine it like a moose lodge or something. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but it's unofficial, you know, it's a loose. club of esotericists. Yeah, and the the, head, the the time traveler is the person whose house they're in. The time traveler is an aristocrat. He has butlers and shit, um, and um, money to pursue his research privately. So that's going on. Uh, it's sort of the backdrop. Uh, at one meeting, the, the guy comes in, the, who, the would-be time traveler, introduces to the group of people that happen to be there that night, because it's not always the same people. Um, they don't know what they're going to get. They get this story about this invention that he has that is a machine that travels through time. The exposition gives a really cool uh, sort of uh, analogy, uh, you know, a two-dimensional plane to a three-dimensional cube and then going from the cube to, like, what about in four dimensions? Sort of a, sort of a, like a layman's four-dimensional geometry and proceeds from there, kind of does the job of explaining the basic idea of time travel so that every other time travel story ever written since doesn't have to. Um, and <laughs> and yet they do. Um, and we have a you know the commentary of the various people who are identified by profession mostly at the table. Um, and we get then the historical uh sorry we get the account of oh oh my god i I missed something right so then they all go away that night they're like oh my god did that model that he made of the time machine really disappear into time was it a trick whatever they come back a a week later expecting those of those of them that returned including our narrator of course um are expecting a story perhaps about a guy who successfully traveled through time because he had said to them that he was going to try to do that in the intervening week um he's not there at first he comes in extremely disheveled, um, and the people who were there last week are like, oh my god, have you been time traveling? Yes, whatever, and um, they have dinner. He tells the story. Um, the story is this. He goes forward in time, sitting in his study. Eventually, everything around him disappears as it speeds up, speeds up, speeds up. He basically is watching. Um, it's really it's funny because... The intervening years from when this was, has written have, I think, have was written have really improved our ability to imagine some of the descriptions. Um, specifically, the time lapse nature, like of what he's seeing. We've seen time lapse film, like you know, I've seen Koyana Scotzi. I know what it looks like to watch. Uh, I don't know, the the sun speed up around the Earth. You know, nature in fast motion. So you get a lot of descriptors of like trees swelling and then falling and decaying over and over as the years are going by in seconds and stuff. And and then he gr- just kind of guns it, and he goes to the year eight hundred and two thousand seven hundred and one, lands 
in what is basically the same spot, gets out, is immediately greeted by these small cuties known as Eloy. Later we find out they're like utopia. They, he interprets it, the time traveler, who again is a bourgeois guy, interprets this as, oh my God, communism. These people are like, they're good. They live in these great garment, garments. It's basically the Garden of Eden. Um, there's a sphinx behind him. Um, there's old ancient statues. There's no animals. Everything, every plant seems edible or at least non-toxic. Apparently there's no bacteria. There's nothing that could possibly harm people. Um, no diseases, you know. He gets into it later more. They've, they've settled into like, they've found comfort and domesticity and they've, they've pretty much eliminated all of their natural problems. Yes. So he's like, this is great, even if they're... But he also keeps thinking, he has this like liberal competitive worldview of like, okay, like, well, it's because they don't have struggle anymore. They're, they're, they don't care. They have no attention spans. They, they don't care about anything that he's saying. They have no grasp on whatever the science was that got them to this state. So he can't really interact with them. And he has a very like kind of colonial, like, uh, anthropo- like amateur anthropologists, you know, view of them. Right. Um, and so he goes around with them. He eats fruit. He learns a few nouns in their language. Later, he saves one of them from drowning, and none of them seem to. None of the other ones seem to care. Her name's Weena, and I guess another another little disclaimer here. It's a little bit creepy the relationship that he has with Weena because it's he's not sure what age she is because everyone looks kind of uh, um, what's the word um, so everyone's kind of neotenous. They don't they they both like mature extra quickly it seems, but also like don't really look fully adult when they're grown. So she's kind of childlike, and he doesn't really think that she's anywhere near. As it's old kind of like, as, yeah, it kind of it kind yeah. of felt like how how a cat kind of looks the same the whole time. Yeah, it's a little pedophilic some of the undertones of it, but she's also kind of like his daughter, even though there's an element of flirtation. It's very strange. That's what I was gonna say. It's got kind of like a weird like surrogate daughter thing where it's like, yeah, well, we're not related by blood. Yeah, yeah. It, you it, said it. It, it. it kind of felt weird. Definitely, definitely dated uh, in terms of like uh, social norms and stuff. I mean, the, the, of course, the way out of this is that it's not H.G. Wells telling the story. It's a guy no, who I mean, it's an aristocrat, a guy who we would be critical of is telling, is telling yeah. the story. So anything so, he says, you know. So that's one thing I wanted to hit on earlier, actually, was the um, the the storytelling uh, device or whatever that it's kind of. um epistemological almost it's like it's it's treated as like an account firsthand by the person that experienced it it's very cool it's treated like a primary source mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. or i suppose a secondary source of the world because it's being relayed to us by a second narrator that's true yeah i, I yeah, it, it's, it's both um, inter- the... it's funny that we talked about documentaries today when this is kind of presented as a documentary yeah totally Totally. Good point. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so we have this, this narrator who's got a lot of class and race biases and, and is moving through this world, trying to figure it out, thinks it's communism. Later we, eventually he starts to see things that don't add up. He sees out of the corner of his eye, small white creatures from a distance. He realizes that the Eloy are extremely afraid of the dark. He notices that there isn't really any social use of fear. You know, they have a behavior, which is go at, go inside at night, especially on very dark nights when there's no moon. Don't go out, you know, sleep when it's dark, do nothing else. But they don't really have any response when something bad happens in front of them. You know what I mean? Like fear is almost, they, they, they have fear, but they don't have any level of, they haven't, used, they haven't a wit sufficient to develop any kind of response to that fear that will help them. Because when they're presented with challenges, normally it's just like one if 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 your only challenge for hundreds of thousands of years is the idea is is that like event, every once in a while somebody drowns you know but no one gets attacked by animals or whatever um the idea is that from the time machine operator's perspective like there's not really a need for fear because that that was just that there was nothing that could have been done to change that situation i, I don't know maybe that's i don't think that's right but it, i think it's basically the perspective of the time traveler it's a very like kind of individualist kind of worldview that he has, or subtly at least. Um, um, 
maybe I'm over interpreting too, or or just kind of like not quite right interpreting. So, kind of. Sometimes, sometimes I wonder when, um, like, social commentary started being in in like uh, new genres. You know. Mm, you mean in like something like fantasy? Yeah. 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 I wonder. I wonder if that was like something that it was considered at the time. I wonder if it was something that was always there or always could be there or if it's something that because it I could mean, be true that just like the really good ones had it you know what i so, mean right what, I, what i'm driving at is that like you know you read tolkien and everybody's like oh it's about the first world war and tolkien's like no it's just a it's a story I, i'm just wondering whether certain kinds of texts you know in the infancy of their genre were written with the intention mm. of, of being understood you, you know yeah socially Right, like was was H. G. Wells like pioneering in that regard? Yeah, or, or not? Uh, it just it just kind of seems like stuff like this isn't meant to be understood in that way. It's not meant. Oh to be no, this in that no, way. this is explicitly. This is we. It's well. This is like well understood as is that so, explicitly okay. a socialist? I, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I I don't know about H. G. Wells like that, so I'm mm-hmm. speculating, I guess. Um. So yeah. So. Um. What was I gonna? So just to pick up on the narrative, let me speed this up a little bit because it is taking a bit longer than I wanted. Um, for for a more, short story, it's pretty fucking long. Yeah, so it's a it's a full novella for sure. Yeah. It's the right name for it. Yeah, it's I think. not a short story. Yeah. Um, you told me Mountains of Madness was a novella, and the recording I found was nineteen hours long. So there is not something no like nineteen that. hour. <laughs> okay, that's it somebody. Was nine re- hours. That's somebody reading it like eight times. Maybe it was nine hours. It's like Maybe seven I... chapters. That book is not that okay. much. Okay, there's something. There's it some kind of discrepancy chapters, here. Okay, so, so basically, basically the next thing that happens after he's sort of been observing them is that he figures out that there are. Oh, he notices. Okay, no. So the next thing that happens is he notices that his his time machine is gone. Um, so he freaks out. He's pretty mean to the. Eloy and stuff and they don't know anything and they're scared of him and they can't really understand him anyways and so eventually he figures out that he has to go down into the Morlocks holes he figures out that well he figures out there are other creatures there right that are I think he sees one of them even above ground and kind of gets the idea oh man and realizes that the holes in the ground that he thought were wells shout out to H.G. Wells maybe I don't know um, are actually <laughs> entryways I commentary. <laughs> are meant <laughs> yeah, the author inscribes himself in the work, like Stephen so, King. So he goes down into, into one of these holes in the ground on this flimsy ladder and finds a little shoot off of it. Has no idea what happens if he falls because it seems to just go on. But he finally takes a takes a left or something like that. You know, takes a side route, goes into this tube and sees dimly with the light of his match. Which, by the way, the Eli love the matches. They've never seen fire. Except for with lightning, I guess. Um, so he he brings the match in and he sees dimly uh, these Morlocks, these creatures that are like they look like this, they sound like Gollum basically, this, and, and they're eating red meat. And he smells the smell of blood, and he assumes immediately this is the Eloi. I think with pretty good reason that the, the Eloi are being eaten by these creatures. Um, Although he hasn't actually seen any Eloy being taken, so it's possible they have another source of red meat, yada yada. He basically barely escapes because they're all they all try to grab him, and then he runs, gets up the shit out of there, and thus begins, I think, his quest. Right? He tries to take, he takes Weena to this building that he sees off in the distance, which turns out to be an ancient ruined museum, which is one of the coolest image-wise, I think, parts of it the was book. Really, but I don't it know was if really he... cool set piece. Yeah, yeah. Um... And he finds a crowbar and some more matches and, um, what does he do? Uh, he's trying to bring Weena back with him, but he gets stuck in the forest at night and the Morlocks are coming. He accidentally (laughs) lights the entire forest on fire, um, gets out. Weena does not get out and he, even though he saved her and then... Only well, to he cause her. her death. I don't again. know about save. Well, he saved her from drowning. Okay. Yeah. And then she liked him a lot. And then he, instead of being like, "This is weird," he was like, "Okay, fine." <laughs> it's like, uh, I don't know. It's just like when Frodo picked up Gollum or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and, uh, now Skiff on the cat.
So then, so then he gets on the hill and sees the fire burning and a lot of Morlocks died and he's really, really happy about that and seems to excuse Weena's death partly on that basis. He basically is like, oh, it's better that she died in that fire than being eaten by those Morlocks. Like, fuck you, dude, personally. It's kind of one of these moments where like, this guy hates poor people so much that he thinks it's better to die in a fire than to be like killed by a poor person is essentially the vibe that I got, which just a weird... Like a weird distinction to make. Yeah, it's a weird know? thing to think about. It's uh, not the same as saying I'd rather drown than be set on fire. It's, exactly. It's exactly. Can you imagine if that's what it was? Would you yeah. rather be killed in fire or be killed by an just a band killed of by hungry poor, poor people? Person. Yeah. <laughs> Pitchfork peasants, yeah. The perennial dilemma, right? Uh, okay, so he gets back to the home area and to hit and he's really tired he's been hiking in the all morning or whatever you know and he sleeps he sleeps a little bit gets ready to uh gets up at around sunset now he's confident that he's not gonna fall asleep at night and be eaten by the morlock so he's in a good position basically he has his crowbar and he has a bunch of extra matches which he hasn't had to use yet he sees in front of him um the sphinx which was next to his machine in which he assumes the machine is inside he, he sees that the door is open he gets to the, the sphinx pops into the doorway knows that they're trying to ambush him he has that instinct he goes to light one of the matches um the match is a strike on, i love this the match is strike on box so he can't light the match <laughs> so he climbs onto the time machine battling these morlocks off can't like almost Loses one of his levers to the time machine, which is needed to activate it. Gets on. By the way, they've oiled the time machine, which is a clear sign of intelligence. But he, even then, he finds a way to dismiss them as just contemptible fools. He's like, oh, in their dim way, they took it apart. Like, clearly the Morlocks are way smarter than anyone here. Uh, I don't know. But again, they. so he, he gets on the machine, turns the lever, gets the heck out of there, goes forward instead of backward in, in, in time by accident says you know hey what the hey and uh when he lands he sees like some giant crab people or something and then he goes forward and there's more crab people and he goes forward so far that there's just moss and um the sun is larger now and then he's like okay that's enough and he goes home that's the then that so then you you get another meeting you get the you go back to the present time right the meeting and and he's finishing the story um and uh the everyone's kind of like wow what the shit you know that was pretty crazy and leaves and the guy what's his name says like i want to want to come back and talk to you about this or something and so he does and as he's entering the time traveler's house he sees the machine disappearing in the room where he keeps it um and no one's seen except for him and it's been three years now and no one knows where the time machine is or the time traveler the end essentially yeah okay so i uh, suddenly i have more to talk about than i did before there was like some decent horror in this. Um, at least that one instance that I remember, which was um, he's talking about like pawing around for the match, and he can't can't get it to light because it's strike on box. Um, and uh, he's talking about like he can feel the hands like on his legs and on his back and around his neck and everything, and like that really that was really good. I was really. Mm-hmm. I was I that's probably the thing that I was most impressed about. Um totally. in, good in fucking his, story. story. Well good good suspense. Well. Good moment. I thought that I thought that was a really effective moment of horror. I think um I think I'm learning about myself that horror gets me more in, in books than it does in other mediums. Gotcha. I mean video games are the worst because it's interactive, but and I suppose real life would probably be pretty bad too. But then it wouldn't be horror. It, it, I'd be horrified. <laughs> fair um i think that's what distinguishes terror from horror yeah I, terror is when it's real yeah could be um so fire and lightning what was the thing about fire and lightning um i'm struggling to remember i, I thought it was really cool and i had something about it but it, you'll have to say it again i think that i see something about fire and light um yeah well you, well, oh, you that were they hadn't about seen that. fire except for oh, perhaps right, right, lightning right, 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 right. so so do you remember benny do you remember way back when we recorded um, our shared mythology and we were talking about um, talking about uh, talking about fire? Yeah. How, how like fire might have been like the big. I mean, obviously it was like kind of the the 
point of change in humanity. Um, assuming one of them, yeah. Assuming, I mean, in a way, it was the change, but in another way, language was the change. You know. Yeah. Yeah. What what I'm driving at is that it's one of a couple moments, and um, I I was talking. I th- I feel like I was I, I talked about like, what haven't we lost fire, now? Like, f- fire fire making isn't really a skill that people have. Uh, certainly, fire keeping is not really a skill people have. I mean, they should people throw plastic on fire. <laughs> mm. You know, fire fire is something that we're kind of out of touch with, and yet it's still yeah, it still has this primal thing for us i mean there's no there's no feeling that's the same as as sitting around a bonfire yeah i've never made fire straight from the earth i've never made a fire from scratch i've always used a mix no you know one one thing one thing i mean to do this summer is learn like the bow thing yeah you have like a hearth board and totally start a fire with a stick i don't know why it's called a bow i mean it always just looks like a stick but you should do it that's really cool it doesn't seem like it's that hard i mean you need some materials and stuff, but that's not the point. Um, it's, I, I don't know. I was just interested uh, again by, you know, I don't think somebody in 1895 or whatever imagined that fire was something that was, had, had like the level of impermanence that it does, that it'd be lost so quickly. hundred, a hundred years ago, everybody knows how to make a fire. No matter what, because that's how you light the stove. Right, everybody knows today, at least what today like, is the thing that only a few people know. Whereas, like, it's it's yeah, it's it's become like a rare skill again. It's become like an actual skill. Like, like building a fire is today what I think probably making a fire back then from like flint and wood would have been. Like, that's what I'm, like making a spark. You know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. It's so interesting that in this story he imagines he imagines that as like like a side effect of. 800,000 years of progress or at least in terms of time and there's a couple times when he says things when the time traveler who I think the the blog post that I had you read from what's his name Mark Gorshin or something it. like that I tried but he, you called me when I was reading okay. it, so he that that post like talks about I still have you know the two you. levels of bias the bias of the aristocrat time traveler and the bias of the socialist well stand in um, Hellier, <laughs> um, Hillier, how he, yeah, how he's like. A lot of the com- more communist stuff might have been overemphasized, but I don't think that's most. Of, and and even the blog blogger acknowledges that might not be the case. But it seems like that the this guy is this time traveler is basically a rich social democrat. Like a, maybe he's a he's he's a liberal, but he's he he thinks communism might be inevitable, whether or not he wants it to happen, right? Um, and he talks about like, oh, like the, you know, the, the lessening of, uh, sexual dimorphism, you know, the diminishing of sexual dimorphism as, a, as, as being directly related to what were then current trends, you know, um, division of labor going away. He talks about things that like are already that are already happening and they're, they're happening self-consciously, not because of the, and the, I actually, the way I would say it is a lot of the things that he talks about as hap- happening over needing to, to happen over hundreds of thousands of years are literally happening. Like are literally happening in, in generations. It took a century. Yeah. Yeah. Including the, 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 the real prospect of capitalism eating the world and, and destroying mm-hmm. any semblance of what is recognizable as humanity. Because really, even if at first the Eli seem like the descendants of humanity, to know this, that they are only the descendants of specific aspects of what is considered human right now yeah, kind of changes that. This is why I suggested that you pay particular attention to chapter 13. Mm, yeah, the, 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 the exposition dialogue at the very beginning of yeah. that was great. I, I, the I, article I, that I sent you quoted part of it, too. Yeah, well, when I was, when I was, making, more. When I was making my little notes, I, I was like, oh, that's a good sentence. I should write that down so we can talk about that. And then the next sentence I was writing down, and it got to the point where I was like, oh, well, I'm going to have to write the whole fucking chapter if I do this, so I'll just stop. Mm. I, I th- I, I'm sure it stopped. I'm sure it only lasted for a couple paragraphs, but there's some pretty good stuff I'm going to read that later. Word. Randy, I just had a thought. I wrote down a lot of straight thoughts got? here. 
I don't want to read my stray thoughts in, in the major episode. I want this to just be more like us ta- having the conversation that we're already having and then do an appendix that's just a buzz through of like some of the less okay. specifically okay. like because some of the things I just like I don't need to, I don't need to go into like all the quotes I wrote down. You know yeah, what I, mean? I mean, yeah, I, I wrote down much less than you, but I've still got a couple like things that I think we could probably just rip off. And yeah, yeah, I don't think it's important that we talk about whether or not this this story started people saying Eureka. <laughs> I've literally I've never heard it used earnestly anywhere else besides this story. Wow, I that that to me seems like a thing that only or like a Victorian prick like the time traveler might do. Yeah, <laughs> or one of his friends. Yeah. So since I've got a lot less than you, uh, why do I, you touched while you were going through the plot on oh, just about everything I've written down except for that. So, so I'll keep going through. So I think we oh, said totally. what we need to say about fire. Um, uh, let's let's jump back to the beginning because this is another one you specifically touched on. Um, it really really got my my gears turning when uh, he he talked about how because you can render a, a three-dimensional image in 2d space that you should therefore be able to do the same with four dimensions in 3d space and it's just a matter of figuring it out just a matter of figuring out how to vi- visualize it mm-hmm. of course i mean that's different in 2d sp- in okay. 3d space and it, i mean it's not just about it's not like a rival where we can just project an image but yeah made me think about it made me think about models of tesseracts that i've seen have you ever seen it? Have you ever seen those? Like, no, I have no idea. What... A tesseract is like a four-dimensional cube. Oh well, then maybe. I... Watch well, like you can see like a GIF of one. Maybe I'm thinking of the word tessellate. Oh yeah, yeah, I've definitely seen. Those. People have also built like little models yeah. of them in different because it doesn't have one shape, right? Like it can be displayed in different ways when it's in 3D. It's a three-dimensional shadow. They say. Yeah. 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 I'm definitely thinking of the word tessellate, which now I know what it means. Okay. Um. Yeah, that, I don't know. That, that was just something really imaginative. I wasn't expecting. It happened so early in the book. Really set expectations that you know didn't end up being that. I mean, I didn't hate the book, but that that kind of set me up for something I wasn't really going to get. Mm. Um, one thing about this is that, like it's not hard sci-fi. This is very mm. very soft sci-fi. It's closer to sci fantasy than it's it's more like Star Wars than it is like Arrival. Yes. Um, so can I pose a question to you or were you about to pose a question to me well this is relevant here too time, time travel fiction right like is this story the lord of the rings of, of future time travel fiction um, do you know what I mean I do know what you mean I have trouble placing it because the only sci-fi fiction I've ever really paid attention to aside from like when it, I can't avoid it like in I mean, all kinds of things. All kinds of things. You mean specifically time travel, time travel or just yeah, ta- I, time travel is like a very specific contrivance. Um, I, I don't think this. I don't think this does that for for sci-fi. I, I I would struggle to think. Like I I kind of almost feel like it took until like Asimov to to do sci-fi. Oh, interesting. Um, I could be wrong. I'm not like a sci-fi guy, in that way. Um, but the only real, the only real time travel stuff I ever got into was Doctor Who, and it's like, I mean, they they invented the word timey wimey for a reason. It's like pure nonsense. To warn you. Yeah, it's just like uh, time travel to me. I just hate. I, I don't know. I like it because Doctor Who is like a fun okay. show, but I don't know. I I just I I just don't I just don't know enough about like sci-fi and uh, yeah and time travel to to say whether this was the I wouldn't be surprised if it was but I I have to I I almost feel like War of the Worlds is more more of that I wasn't talking I was specifically talking about time travel though okay to, uh, to well, be clear yeah time travel it definitely could be um I don't see a lot of Doctor I don't see a, I mean there's some of this in Doctor Who but yeah I I don't I don't really know I've never seen Back to the Future for example well something just occurred to me L- listen to this right like maybe what I'm really asking is are you as ignorant as I am about time travel fiction? Like I said, I've never even seen Back to the Future. Because after all, our whole assertion that like Lord of the Rings is like unsurpassed in fantasy. What I mean by that isn't like oh, yeah. Easy. it's literally the book. It's more, I mean it is it is in many ways unsurpassed, but a lot of the ways in which it's unsurpassed, I'm kind of imagining simply because I haven't actually read a lot of well, fantasy. You, 
So I don't want to over general. Well, let me. I don't want to over generalize that on that point, right? Like and, and the same thing here. I, I think that there's something in this time travel story that is like unique, and maybe there's aspects of it that probably haven't been improved upon. But I wouldn't be as confident saying that if I read. I have a feeling if I read more time travel fiction, I would be like, well, what about this counterexample? You know, what about this story? What about that? S- s- so I have I have some thoughts on this that I've had for a while. Um, if you if you watch something like if you've never heard of Lord of the Rings and you watch Game of Thrones and then you read Lord of the Rings or you watch Lord of the Rings, you're going to be like, this shit is so stupid compared to Game of Thrones. Where's all the sex? Um, I think I think when we're very far separated from from the the contemporary time of of when something came out and and set the framework we we begin to think of it as run of the mill when we have to understand that it is the mill <laughs> right that's great yeah, yes yeah yes so so that is I, in that sense i feel like the, this is what lord of the rings is in that particular sense what where where's the time travel before this this is the the mill yeah the only the only fantasy that even resembles um uh, mo- what modern fantasy looks like which is like gritty and like kind of lame and like really shitty and nothing good really ever comes out anymore um the, the close it gets is like the king of elfland's daughter i think i think that's like the and it's it's still not really the same as as what we have now which is like tolkien invented everything that yeah. we have in fantasy tolkien basically invented a, a mythological right. space it's so, kind of like what borges was talking about in the ton ukbar or Bistricius, where like in that case a secret society intentionally invents like a whole fantasy world of a fake country whereas tolkien did it because he, i don't know he just hit on something he opened a space so I, it's pretty it's pretty far across the room where i'd go get it so i could tell you what it says what, what, what it is but i have a i have a book by clark, clark ashton smith that i i was going to begin reading tonight because i got through fellowship and um, it's it's like weird fantasy, I guess is what I understand of it anyway. He was a contemporary of, of Lovecraft. Lovecraft. He was like a favorite writer writer of Lovecraft's. So I'm assuming it's not going to really be what I expect of fantasy. Um. See, Game of Thrones, right, is something I would call a hard fantasy. Um, where I would not call this a hard sci-fi. Mm. Yeah, um, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Yeah, Lord of the Rings is a hard fantasy, but it's but it's also nothing like Game of Thrones. They both exist in in the. They both basically are subgenres of what I would call Tolkien fan fiction, which is basically in specific case of fantasy. I think that the normative fantasy book is basically an example of Tolkien fan fiction. It's just that fan fiction, in particularly like that world. Um, has become so like it's so of course fan fiction of course we usually think of people using the same characters and stuff like that and there's very little of that in fantasy but you don't have to the the thing that Tolkien did was he fleshed out so much detail he created such a rich world that it's like it's like fan fiction about on the level of like the production of the characters rather you know what I mean you ever you ever think about how like especially with fan fiction like people have written more about i don't know say like an example i've heard before is harry potter people have written more harry potter than jk rowling you know fan yeah fan fiction is a really interesting thing um uh, i i would love to know what uh, i would love to know what a guy like uh h.g wells like uh, he would probably consider other time travel stuff fan fiction i wonder yeah Whereas then you have somebody like Lovecraft who opened up his world to other people to directly write in, which I think is pretty interesting and cool.
so did you like the way that this book handled time travel? Because I'm usually very badly annoyed by it. But I, I, I didn't let myself get there because I knew that the, this is the first instance of time travel in fiction or anything that I've ever heard of. Except for like Sandra Man and stuff. But Here's why I thought it was good. I, there's always going to be problems with time travel. And I think that's related to the fact that in, it can't really exist in any way that we can currently conceptualize it. You know what I mean? So you're always going to be like bumping up against like just flat contradictions. Like the whole, the thing about it time being moving through time, being like the, the spokes on a bike wheel moving really quickly so that they don't interact. Like it's extremely poetic and cool, but if you actually tried to give it the same level of like metaphorical, like r- rigorous analysis of that metaphor as you did with the metaphor of the, of the cube of the 2d space, being recorded in three and therefore imagining the 3d space being recorded in four i said that backwards the 3d and two and the the 40 and three anyways if you if you if you give it that level of rigor it probably doesn't really hold up it's pretty arbitrary um but it adds a flavor it adds like a cool flavor and because hg wells does something that most people don't which is specifically explain sort of the concept give give a conceptual grounding time travel in a particular way that is completely left out of something like um back to the future where it's taken for granted you know what i mean like how it's taken for granted that like it should be possible to imagine somebody moving through time in a story like that whereas hg wells does not take it for granted and that's that's what really sells it for me is that he gives you that idea and he brings you back to it multiple times. And he also, I think, in a couple instances, even makes metaphorical references to it indirectly in a cool poetic way, which maybe we'll talk about that in the appendix because I wrote it down in that. I wrote a note about it. Oh, how about you? So again, I, was, I just was not super impressed by the vast majority of this story. Um, it, it, didn't, it hasn't really stuck to my ribs like that. Well, the thing about this that's also different from, like you said, the Tolkien stuff is that this didn't become commonplace. Part, part of the problem is I friggin' hate the I hate the narrator. He's you such an narrator. asshole. He yeah. is a huge asshole. He's like he's the thing. Of, he's like does his own little genocide. <laughs> yeah. No, no. The thing about the thing about this that's different from from Tol- from like you said, Tolkien being seen as commonplace is that is that uh, this This isn't the normative time travel situation. It's because it's kind of pre-most time travel fiction, you're using this like Victorian like steampunk time machine, basically. What would today be registered as steampunk if it was made? You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, then it was just regular. Yeah, exactly. So it, it's got that going for it, but it also means that like aspects of it that were later thought out really well are just not there. And and yes, to return to what you were saying about the narrator, um the Morlocks. He doesn't mean to kill all of them, but he's really glad when they die. One thing you've you've said about Tolkien before is how, like, and it's true, I think, most of the time, that, like, evil races are bad. It's, like, explicitly bad. You know, at least in Tolkien, like, I can try and talk my way out of it, where it's like, well, actually, they're just, they're clay. They're not even real, because the guy that made them can't, literally cannot create life. But of course, that just means that whoever they, whoever the reader finds them analogous to, you know, that's what it's saying about them as far as the reader is concerned, right? Yeah, it's like a, it's like a like a placeholder that people fill in whether Tolkien wanted them to or not. Yeah, yeah. In this case, they're literally, as far as I can tell, the descendants of human beings. Um, they have cultures, they have feelings, they have ideas that they're trying to do do stuff about i mean obviously what's her name wiener what is it wiener. Wiener. <laughs> so okay so a guy from brooklyn saying wiener a guy from australia in my case uh, i had that i heard him say wiener a couple times when it was followed by a word beginning with a vowel yeah um yeah a wiener uh <laughs> dude they threw they really threw wiener on a barbie in this one. Oh yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so the evil races in this, they're just, they're just alive. They're just, they're like the, like, imagine if you watched Spirited Away and, um, it was like a, a, like a horror movie from the perspective of the little suit goblins that, that Chihiro steps on. (laughs) Like, (laughs) like we get to see him eat a piece of candy and like have fun, like at their job and (laughs) then they get stepped on and brutally murdered. Yeah. Like a figure from 
I, I, literally out of time. So yeah, I I just had a hard I just had a hard time like, I mean, did you I don't know did you watch Game of Thrones? No. Okay. Well, if you're listening, like this to me was like if Game of Thrones was from like Ramsey Bolton's perspective. I don't know who that is. Ramsey. Well, uh, he he he's like just. Uh, he's like a psycho. That's like his only thing. Okay. He just like flays people and cuts their body parts off and stuff. Like, I don't know. I I just thought I just thought this like it was it was so weird to me that like y- yes the narrator definitely is like H G Wells like insert into the story. But you the, mean the, the yeah the the young narrator the the main narrator the outside. Oh, is that is that what you think? I kind of figured that it was the time traveler. Time traveler is not he's like Wells. socialism. No, but H.G. Wells is an actual socialist. The time tra- time traveler again is like as like I said a little bit earlier. He's okay. he's like an aristocrat who like maybe thinks socialism is inevitable, but he's a, he's a liberal. He's a capitalist. He has servants. Mm. Okay, yeah. So I guess he's well. He's not technically the point of view character, but the, he's the fucking main character of the book, and he's a psychopath. And I had yeah. so I had so much trouble staying on board with this story while I was while I was getting through it. Yeah, yeah. so that's where I'm at with that. Um, anyway, uh, the po- uh, uh, back to my back to my list here. I really wanted to give kudos to Huls for uh, saying uh, very simple was my explanation and plausible enough as most wrong theories are. <laughs> I, I that that was the thing that that was another thing that kind of made me that prompted me to ask you about your sensitivity to meta commentary. I, uh, I I'm sure I'm sure like uh, the weirdest fear was not the same back then as it is now. But I don't know that that line I really appreciated. It's really good. He does remind you, even the narrator inside the story, who and here that you know it it was kind of like a butterfly dream thing, right? Right, that could be a line that's that's because of the the communistic bias of H.G. Wells' character, who doesn't well, sorry, who doesn't want to accept some of the conclusions that the time traveler draws, or it could really be very literally what the time traveler said when he was telling the story, because the time traveler himself is a scientist, and despite his his racist and and classist biases, like he does know that when it comes to explaining things, like. You know, he has bias. At least in the big picture, you might be totally wrong. You just don't know. He has very little data. Um, he understands yeah. that he's an unreliable narrator. Yes, he does exactly, exactly. <laughs> so uh, yeah, just hallelujah. Um. Oh yeah. Okay. So I'll just quote myself here instead of quoting H.G. Wells. The storyteller really seems to relish the battering of Morlocks. That it it set me off so bad. Like I don't I don't know it just seemed like it just seemed like he he was like doing it the way that I, I the way that South Park kills Kenny or something. <laughs> he's just, yeah, he's just bloodthirsty. Yeah, he started he started he at one point I I, cl- I clocked this he he stopped referring to it as a crowbar and started calling it a mace. He's an aristocrat looking for an excuse to harm. Yeah, people he, who his ideology doesn't yeah. know how to deal with, and that's yeah. that's that's a really strong line of social commentary that Wells really develops alongside but many see, other. Yeah, things see, I I wasn't juggling. I wasn't expecting, or I you know I decide I decide I decide when I read something this old I can't I can't say that like I'm inserting social commentary or whatever I'm always assuming that it is an expression of the author. And what they believe, you know. So I, I don't know that that might be my own biases putting me off. It certainly is, but it's it put me off all the same. Oh, I, yeah. I I wasn't thinking, man. H. G. Wells is so based. I was thinking, H. G. Wells like keep him out of Africa. <laughs> <laughs> don't <laughs> don't let this guy. Don't let this book get into the hands of the crown. There's a there's a, a transcription linked in the article that I recommended you, which by the way, let me just say the name of it so that it's at least in the episode. I have once. it right here. Um, it is analysis of the time machine by Mar Gorshin. Yes. So Gorshin, um, oh man, what was I gonna say? Gorshin basically gives um, 
Oh, she wells is so based. He, oh, no, oh, you're, you're just, saying yeah, I, can't remember, I can't remember what you were saying now. Me? I was saying I was I was reading I was reading this and I was like H two I was not thinking about how based H two Wells was. I was thinking about like he seems like he's kind of bloodthirsty a little bit. Oh okay. he, he yeah. would have been like a headhunter or something. There's actually an interview later in H.G. Wells' life. Um, uh, he, he sat down for a conversation with Joseph Stalin, and it's linked in that video. It's a long conversation. And it's them, like, politely arguing about Stalin on the right, or not on the right. What am I saying? I'm, I meant to say on one side. I didn't mean to, for that to have political uh, connotations, right? Um, Stalin saying, like, full communism, and H.G. Wells being like, yes, but can't, new like, New Deal-style so like gradualism social democracy get us to the same goal over time so in a way i think hg wells kind of becomes the old man that maybe the time machine is the time traveler is in this story although i i would hope and i i have reason to believe without the extreme class and racial biases you know i'm not trying to absolve him of anything he might have said but he's not he's not the villain that this guy is in the story yeah, I, I guess part part of it's my fault for well, all of it's my fault. I, I'm the one doing all the interpreting, but um, I didn't I didn't do my research on H.D. Wells. I should have, I guess. Um, and this maybe is an exception, and not the rule that I can't apply like my modern point of view to a book that happened forever ago. Yeah. I, I don't know. I just don't have the benefit of having read this before, I guess. I, you know, having time to sure. digest it and everything. Right. And when I read it, I, like, did a bunch of research right after I read it to find See, out. I, I wasn't tempted. So, so uh, let's... I'm going to read some chapter 13. Okay. All right. I grieved to think how brief the dream of the human intellect had been. It had committed suicide. It had set itself steadfastly towards comfort and ease, a balanced society with security and permanency as its watchword. It had attained its hopes to come to this at last. Once life and property must have reached almost absolute safety. The rich had been assured of his wealth and comfort, the toiler assured of his life and work. No doubt in that perfect world there had been no unemployed problem, no social question left unsolved, and a great quiet had followed. It is a law of nature we overlook. The intellectual versatility is the compensation for change, danger, and trouble. An animal perfectly in harmony with its environment is a perfect mechanism. Nature never appeals to intelligence until habit and instinct are useless. There is no intelligence where there is no change and no need of change. Only those animals partake of intelligence that have met a huge variety of needs and dangers. So, as I see it, the upper world man had drifted toward his feeble pettiness, prettiness, sorry, and the underworld to mere mechanical industry. But that perfect state had lacked one thing even for mechanical perfection, absolute permanency. Apparently, as time went on, the feeding of an underworld, however it was affected, had become disjointed. Mother Necessity, who had been staved off for a few thousand years, came back again, and she began below. The underworld being in contact with machinery, which, however perfect, still needs some little thought outside of habit, had probably retained perforce, rather than more initiative, if less of every other human character than the upper. And when other meat failed them, they turned to what old habit had hitherto forbidden. So I say I saw it in my last view of the world of 800 and 2,701. It may be as wrong an explanation as mortal wit could ever invent. It is how the thing shaped itself to me, and as that I give it to you. I was... I was blown away. I love that. I, I thought that was some super effective writing. That's really like the meat and potatoes of this story to me. Um... That that uh, it it really is just exposition is like a little bit of world building and it happens right at the end. Um, it's it's you know it's the filling between a very lopsided sandwich. 
Yeah, and he keep, he actually gives you little spoonfuls of that filling earlier in the story, and then he's like, okay, maybe not. Maybe that's a little bit wrong. And then he gives you another one, and he's like, mm, maybe that's a little bit wrong. And yeah. then you get to that at the end. He just puts it all. He puts together everything that he thinks happened in those like three, four paragraphs. That's that's what that's what I'm talking about. It's like I love so much to to have a mystery unfold, and that to me was that to me was like Sherlock Holmes at the end when he's like that's how H.G. Wells figured out H.G. Wells by doing that wrote a story that without these devices in this particular way risked being extremely pedantic extremely just like dialectical like oh well don't you have these things in the future no yeah. like you know what I it's, mean like he 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 sh- gives you so much richness of like this is how you might have actually heard the story from somebody that you knew or whatever like that it really and you and because you're listening to somebody telling a story somebody else told, you also like you expect that kind of thing, that kind of summarizing. You know, how did yeah. this guy tell me how he thought through this process? It yeah. works so well. So something I, I feel like I've heard it out of. I, I feel like I heard it from George Martin. I'm, I have no idea where he got it from, but um, maybe it's his idea. I don't know. But he he talks about like I, I I'm forgetting what exactly he said but I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and say like you there, there's a difference between a planter and a harvester right um as as storytellers like a planter like drops this thing in and is is the person the person that takes care of it from you know seed germination into sprouting and being a plant you know you you build everything brick by brick and you get to the end of the story that way um, and then you have the harvester who is like still, uh, of course, a writer and an inventor in a way, but you know, they come, they have, they have like an idea and then they go to the next one and then they go to the next one. And by the end, they've got all the ideas of the book. And, um, I, I really love the way that, that HG Wells planted the story and you, you know, it's like almost, he's figuring, like you say, he's figuring out for himself in real time what the story is. And you're it's, listening, part of, it's part of the story. You're listening to somebody figuring out how to tell a story, and you're in the story that they're telling is somebody figuring out how to tell a story, and the well, story that that person is telling is them figuring out a world as they went through it, and that you get the, also the feeling that H.G. Wells was kind of figuring out aspects of it as he went along. That's exactly that's it's like the thing that I love about somebody like Arthur Conan Doyle, right? He he comes up with this this mystery right and it's not it's not hard uh, somebody like stab somebody that's the mystery but the the interesting part is that, that then he has to figure out like oh i deduce this but actually i was wrong and then so instead i i should follow the other thread and i love that kind of stuff yeah so much yeah it's it's got a bit of mystery novel to it the fact that it's also but so I, it's kind I, of anthropological self-consciously yeah even. that's what um, i mean um i i just wish i i wish i could have felt that through the whole time instead of i get it yeah. at the end because like uh, i finally uh, don't hate the guy i think this is kind of a mood thing too i and the thing is i don't think that guy's fully right right like he, we, but he acknowledges that he's not fully right he acknowledges that he has biases or he doesn't say i'm biased therefore this but he's not he doesn't hide his biases that he brings to the world, right? He talks about them the whole goddamn time. He talks about the emotional reactions that he has and all this. So he, so you see somebody struggling with this, and so they do. He does come up with an interpretation which is both overall, I think, probably right, and has a conclusion which is I, a scientist who is an aristocrat, went into the future and learned something poignant and horrible mm-hmm. about the fucked up things about the world that I'm of my time and how it's going to develop. But I also still have all of those biases that were conditioned into me from the world that I, that I live in that I normally would not be critiquing in this way. Um, You know, except in a very vague, um, it's about, it's about something that you only have vague conceptions about that you're not really invested in. Cause again, he's also an aristocrat suddenly being thrust at you and seeing the implications of the things that there are, that, that now you are dealing with being forced to see them right um and so the intriguing thing then is that if he's wrong if the time traveler is wrong and they're actually the morlocks were just eating a deer or whatever you know they you know they maybe they're they bite and attack but they don't actually have any interest in the eloy if somehow all that is 
actually true and it was just his bias that made us and him think that he still he still projected onto the world that he went to his deep fear or like unconscious things of like a, un, the contradictions of capitalism that he was not looking at in his own time do you know what i mean like he saw how bad it could get even though he wasn't a communist he wasn't you know again he was kind of a, a theoretical social democrat he wasn't really a communist and now he's seeing this horrible reality interesting that he actually does not choose to stay in the reality when he comes back it seems like it kind of got ruined for him because now once yeah. that dimension is opened up to you that is just as real as where you are now and i think that's the implication of what he's saying oh my is God, that dude, you i watch arrival we got to do uh, that before you go wow okay okay we'll do it I, I i think we need to talk for a few minutes after the show um cool yeah, I another thing I you know I really appreciated the ending of this. I appreciate. Well, I don't know. Maybe did he write a sequel? I don't know. I don't think so. No, it was screaming sequel to me, and I was so satisfied that I didn't have to. I don't know. I love that it was. I love that there was another mystery at the end, without without the first having been solved. It could be that just a lot of great stories end on a mysterious note like that, and that like maybe the practice of writing sequels, yes, part I of the temptation comes from like, being like, man, why did I end it that way? Oh, everyone likes it. Maybe I should just kind of. I you think know, everyone I think, asks me what happened. Oh, I'll just write what happened, and then boom, you're writing sequels. I think. Um, I think maybe it was Poe. I think Poe's last story is like, is it unfinished or is it? Is this how it was? And he just hadn't started the next one yet. Is, um, mm. I, I'm fa- I'm fairly certain it's Poe. His his uh, one of his final stories ends in such a way that like, is this how the story ends or? Cool. It, it, it was it just not finished, and then he went and said Croatoan and died. His last words were Croatoan, allegedly. Yeah. Uh, what if it? What if it, he was gonna say Poetoan and then he just fucked it up? He croaked. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll never know. Okay, Croatoan. Um, okay. I don't feel like we've gone quite crazy enough at least not quite as crazy as maybe time travel asks us to go. So I wanted to end with the question that all great time travelers ask and have been asked. Um, would you rather go to the future or the past? Would I rather go to the future or the past? I would rather go, I think, mm, I was going to say future, but I'm kind of like, mm past i think that i'm kind of it's possible that we're actually closer to where where um time traveler goes 800 and 2701 meaning that like if we go much farther forward, I, think it's pretty, I think it's pretty much 2020 i think that it was pretty much the year the apocalypse happened we go much farther forward it's gonna yeah what he was really writing about was the acceleration 20, of time yeah. 2020 was the backstory of this book 2021 is the when the story takes place yeah that's right yeah so yeah, maybe I'd rather go to the past. There's some stuff I'd yeah. like to see. There's some languages I would like to hear spoken. There's some writing I would, writing systems I would like to see. Things like that. There's, I, think the, I think the past might better suit my lifestyle. If I could live forever and had a time machine, I would spend my time in the past. So, 100%. so when do you think you might want to go? There's some there's what? some big ones that people mm-hmm. always hit on. You know, people talk the Renaissance. Um, I want to go to Etruria, Tos- ancient yeah. Tuscany. I want to see the Tuscans. I want to go a little farther back. I want to ask them about their their histor- their history, where they're from, how they got there. Um trace that back. I'd love to I'd love to put some of my uh I'd love to put some weed in, like in my backpack and go and talk to like uh Confucius or like Zhuangzi or something. Yeah, I'd like to <laughs> if I had enough time, I would I would seek out mystics you have, from all areas. All the time. That's the thing. Oh or my do god. You? I don't know. Well, I think you might still age, but if you could not age, oh my god, the places I would go. I want to hear stories told. I want to I want to ask, I want to go to a a, a time. I'll go just drop me somewhere anywhere in the world, literally any community. Ask a storyteller to tell me to tell me a story about X thing. Go a little farther back. Ask about the same story. Go a little farther back. Ask about the same story, etc., etc., etc. Just do that for a story, and then go back to the fu- to the present. Pick a different one and do the same thing. Pick a different one, do the same thing. That I would there's, do. Yeah, there's definitely some some things I would like to verify. You know, 
I also, you know, I, I, it's it's a shame because it, it, obviously it's not possible. I, I'm not I'm not the time travel guy. I don't think that's happening. Or yeah, John Teeter can stay wherever he is. Um, there's certain things like you know I kind of I kind of want to know if Buddha was real. You know I want to know if Jesus was like really real and like walking the talk. Right, was he one guy? Yeah. But most of all, I think I think I would like to see like Rome on its very best day. You know, if you, they can miss me with the future. I don't want to know where this goes. <laughs> like I'm already like, where's my stop? You know. Once you travel around in the past enough, I think that well, what what happens is if you spend enough time in the past, you well, already have gone to the future. Think about think about this though, right? You travel around the past long enough you become like a legend you are like that's the guy true. that's everywhere you are like the flood myth made man you know what ends up happening is that if you go that's like yeah. saint germain you know who's saint germain he's the well we'll talk about him next time okay he's the he's the mount shasta man he's the oh yeah Crucian stuff yeah, like you just become like you become like the god of like if I were to do that story thing that I said and just go to different places and t- and like listen to a story, listen to a story, listen to a story, and then 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 there would develop a parallel story that's associated with those stories of like the visitor, you know, and then the visitor archetype would be like gradually yeah, like... incorporated into those stories and basically would become a god all over the world that happens yeah, to appear in a bunch of different myths and legends and everyone would be like, I wonder what the shit that's about. <laughs> you, you, be, you become like a Prester John or, or the Wandering Jew. Like, you become that person. But, you, but really. But like really, right. Really, 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 yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's the past for me. Oh my god, that's so cool. Uh, there's more we could have said about the time machine, but I think we should just stop. <laughs> that was you, really you still cool. have an appendix you want to do. Uh, we can do it later, honestly. I mean, I don't want to do it today. Yeah, yeah, me neither. We exactly. already have some stuff that I think we probably should talk about. Yeah, let's just like um, talk. Yeah. yeah. So uh, anyway, that's the Time Machine by H.G. Wells. I think that's how he would want to say it. He was English. That's true. Um, His first name was H. Yeah, H. John Benjamin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. We'll cut it in post. Um, all right. Good night and good luck. Thank you for listening to Depth Perception. You can support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel, kicking us a little bit of scratch on Patreon.